Good morning, everybody. Uh, today is at coder round 176. Um, it's very early in the morning for me, but that's fine. We can compete anyway. And uh, I'll be competing live in this contest. If you're interested in solutions, those will be at the end of the video. Um, and then during contest, the goal is to solve set because it's an at coder beginner contest. Uh, so we'll solve as many as we can and we'll see. Um, good luck, have fun to everyone who's competing, and let's begin. Alright, everyone always tells me to middle click. I'll finally teach myself to do that, how about that? Alright. Problem A. Let's triple check everything's working alright. Seems to be. Uh, this person loves a ball-shaped snack. He can take at most X pieces at a time. Taking T minutes regardless of the number of pieces he takes. How long does it take him to take uh, this many? So ceiling of division times T. Very good. Single test case even. Even nicer. Alright, so what is the input format? Um, you need N of them. Then... going to be n plus x minus 1 over x times t. Don't forget to do main. Also, let's make it bigger for people. Looks like we got it. Very good. Multiples of nine. Um, an integer n is a multiple of nine if only if the sum of its digits and decimal representation is a multiple of nine. Determine if n is a multiple of nine. Well, it's very nice that they tell you the solution to the problem right here. Uh, <laughs> sounds good to me. minus zero this out sum mod nine to the zero if it is the answer is yes otherwise the answer is no uh you mean a, a no example very good oh let's not forget main and then, uh, find a problem C. You have N people standing in a row. The height of the ith person um, from the front is AI. We have to choose, got it. We have to choose, uh, or we want to have each person stand on a stool of some heights. The following condition is satisfied. Nobody in front of the person is taller than the person. Find the minimum total height of stools needed to reach this goal. Well, greedy works, just sweep from the beginning to the end. So, one, zero, one, uh, two. Yep. Very good. So read the array of size n, uh, long x equals 0, so this out the answer, and then, well, we also need the max on a 0, for i and a, max equals math.max of, uh, of i and the max, and the ants plus equals uh, max minus i.
forget there's this really nice submission thing in the bottom. It's like very well designed, I think, in my opinion. And problem D. A maze is composed or a maze is composed of a grid of H by W squares, H horizontal or H vertical, W horizontal. The square is a wall if and only if it's a pound sign. You got a magician as well. You can do two types of moves. Walk to a square that is um, horizontally or vertically adjacent. Use magic to warp himself to a road square. Oh, he walked to a road square. Or use magic to warp himself to a road square in the 5x5 five five connected area centered at the square he's currently in. Uh, in either case, he cannot move out of the maze. At least how many times does he need to use magic to reach this thing? Sounds like a 0-1 BFS to me. Yep, we can do that. Um, do they guarantee he's going to start on a road cell? Oh, this is the destination cell. Alright, so, like, can we, is he guaranteed to start on a, I guess just doesn't matter. Okay, so int sx equals this, uh, end, or sy equals this, minus one, and this is really the y coordinate. Yeah, or UI and EX. Okay, so now we have an array deck uh, integer of X's. And an array deck of Y's. Very good. So then, um, we want to do our BFS. We need the board first. So we read this in x, y, uh, this should be width by height, and then uh, yeah, we need to process it. So x is dot add um, s, y, or s, x, y is dot add start y, and we need a 2D array, this equals new int array width by height. Um, yeah, so now, fill this dist array with 10 to the 9, dist at s, x, s, y equals 0, the end, sys out dist at e, x, e, y, is greater than 1, e, 7, it is 
then print negative one, otherwise print dist at ex to ey. All right, so while not start, or not what uh, x means that is empty. have a dx and a dy array. Um, all right. So, int position equals, or int uh, for x equals x is dot remove, for y equals y is dot remove. Um, if, uh, well, that's fine. So now four, int x equals zero, or int uh, direction equals zero, up to four, direction plus plus. Int nx equals the cur x plus dx at d, and y equals cur y plus dx at d, or dy at d. Um, static boolean legal and x and y if x less than zero or y is less than zero or x is greater than the width or y is greater than the height turn false um, or the board at x y is equal to the pound sign we're in trouble So then this needs to be public, int height width, and then a care board. All right. not legal at new x to new y and continue. Um, otherwise what that means we can travel to this position. So now the question is do we want to? So if this at nx uh, and y is greater than this at cur x cur y. Dist to nx and y equals dist to cur x cur y. X is dot add let, or add first uh, the new x and y is dot add first the new y. Okay, so we have that very good. Uh, there's one other case as well. Well, int uh, x equals cur x minus 2, x less than or equal to cur x plus 2, x plus plus. Now we do something very similar here, but slightly modified. So if the distance to x, y is bigger than this, uh, plus one in this case, set it to this plus one, we want to add last. be disk at x. Hmm, that's not right.
Yeah, add, uh... Oh, that's fine. Oh, I guess uh, it's time to debug the BFS. Zero, zero, one, zero. It's a bit odd, isn't it? distance zero, this one's also distance zero. Oh, I've got this. Wait, current x, current y plus one. Assuming this is removed first. So why why can I not write my zero one BFS? What am I doing wrong? Uh should be a plus. Yeah, there you go. Hmm. Minus one, zero, and apparently this is two. Okay. Looks good. We have problem D. Uh, let's move on to E then. Clarifications on which problem? On problem D. Okay. Uh, as someone who cannot read, I'm assuming that's Japanese. It's not a very helpful clarification. Maybe it's a Japanese issue. All right, you've got a bomber. Uh, we have a two-dimensional grid with this many squares. There are M targets to destroy in this grid. The ith one is at this position. You're gonna choose one square in the grid, place a bomb there and ignite it. The bomb will destroy all the things in the row or column where it's placed. Reminds me of like, I think Candy Crush has a similar feature. He's trying to maximize the number of targets to destroy. Find the maximum number of targets that can be destroyed. I think I've seen this before. I think this problem has occurred somewhere else. Um, yeah. I think this is just casework. I think I've seen this this like exact problem before. Let's read F then. Maybe just to think about it. We have three N cards arranged in a row from left to right where each card uh, has an integer between one and N inclusive written on it. The integer on the ith card from the left is AI. Um, N minus one times, you can rearrange the five leftmost card in any order you like, then remove the three leftmost cards. The integers written on these three cards are all equal, you gain a point. Oh, after n minus one operations. Um, a 
Okay. The integers written on the remaining cards are all equal. You gain an additional point. Well, I suppose there's not much decision making to be made, right? Um, okay. I don't think that's too hard. Let's solve let's solve E first maybe. So uh, the idea with this is the following, I guess. Um, usually what we'll do is we'll pick the row with the most bombs. White paint, what am I doing? Nope, whiteboard, that looks good. Uh, We'll pick the row with the most row with the most bombs, and also the column with the most bombs. So if we have something that looks like this, then uh, maybe some other stuff too. Then we can pick this, and we'll get this three uh, plus this three. Now the issue is, it's possible we actually get one fewer than that if uh, if there's a bomb here. So we might get the most plus the most minus one. But it's always, but like it's never beneficial to take a row that has one fewer thing to avoid this space. Because you lose at least one, you gain zero or one. So you always take like a biggest row and also a biggest column. Uh, which means what we can do is we can figure out what is the biggest row. We find what the biggest row is. Then we can uh, see which rows have that, also see which columns have that, and do an n squared but break early. Yeah. So we have a three second time limit. I think that's fine. And uh, let's cut it up. So the, the runtime will be, um, well, linear. Because we're putting this stuff on hash maps. that crash oh. um all right so first we read in the height and the width which I don't think matter at all but that's fine we want to choose one square place a bomb maximum number of targets yeah I think I understand the problem okay so uh, interay wise equals new interay The X's array is also size N. What am I doing? Uh, uh, 
you can just flip it symmetrically so that it's easier to think about. Then, um, then what? So we need a hash map of longs to counters, right? Yeah. So hash set long points, new hash set. And then a hash map integer, or uh, I guess probably, ooh, yeah, hash map of long, or of integer to integer, and on x, or is this just a, uh, are these small? They are small. Int array on x with new int array. Uh, oh, let's make this width and this height then. So the width plus one. We have our height array too. Now we have one more point on this x, and also one more point on this y coordinate. Um, int max x equals zero, max y equals zero. So we want to find what the biggest x and biggest y is. If uh, the number of things on this x bigger than the number of things on the biggest x, then this x equal uh, the biggest x equals this one. Then we want to do the same thing, but with y's. All right. So. Uh, now we need an array list of candidates. y plus plus for less than max y and candidate y's dot add this y. All right, so now we do an n squared. So int ants equals max or er, uh, on x and max x plus on Oh, I see. We can clean this up a bit. store what's the biggest x, the biggest y, then we find all of the x's that have that biggest x and all of the y's that have that biggest y, and then we can always do the biggest x plus the biggest y minus a collision, we might be able to do one better, um, x in candidate x's, or y in candidate y's, If uh, not, what is this called? Uh, points that contains hash of x, y, then ants plus plus and break outer. Let's bring the answer.
Really? That's a bit odd, isn't it? Huh. Well, uh, let's draw out the case. I don't know that I totally believe it. So... We've got two, four, six... Oh, it's only up to five even. One, two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five. Two, five. Four, three. Two, three. Five, five. Two, two. Five four five three five one three five one four. Two. Oh wait, things that start with five. One, two, three, four. So we can pick these four plus these three. Less than or equal to. Oh, that would have been annoying to find. Very good. Thank you for the the case. At Coder Judges, you are very kind. Appreciate it. Assuming this is right, might be wrong. 130 cases. Holy cow! If it passes the first 30, though, we're probably fine. Well, let's think about this for a minute, and then we can go back. We've got a bunch of cards. Let's, uh, what are the standings? How, how easy is this? What? No solves? Wild. No solves, huh? Didn't seem that hard, though. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. Hmm.
I do cast Talons. Wait a minute. That was kind of a stupid submit. Problem, problem bomber. Yeah, okay. Um, so for this next problem, how do we do it? Well, You can do n squared, right? Good. All right. So so we've got an hour to solve this one problem in n squared log n or something or better. So, yeah, it's like important. Is it even important? We've got a lot of freedom. If you're picking three cards that are the same, you can bring two different cards over. You can only bring two different cards over, but that's all you could ever bring anyway. So, Um, in this case, you can only bring, oh, that's weird. Yeah, you can't get both a three and the one. That is wacky. Why is that true? Because you have to delete three of these, which either includes a one or a three. Hmm. If you can include just a two. Um, well, let's pause for a moment. I don't know if this is even... Oh, 3n is quite big. No, it's not. We can still do n squared in that. Uh, the n cubed dp, what would that look like? So, I think we can do an n cubed pretty easily, right? The n cubed would be... You store dp of your position and then what else matters also um, the two cards that you have card one and card two
So what are your choices here? What do the transitions look like? You can go to position plus three. Uh, card one, card two. Oh, and then the two empty, two others. Uh, if you have a match, Or you can go to any of the five, choose two other things. need to I think we need more like I think there are more restrictions implicitly on which cards we're allowed to have like it's not as free as this might make it seem can these two cards just be any two cards uh, no They can be any two cards after a given position. Right. So in this first sample, you're going to have to delete three of these. You can pick either two ones or whatever. You can pick whatever you want. Yeah, sure. But it's got to be two cards after some position. Oh, wait. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So you start with these two, but then you take steps by a size of three. So when you do this, you still have two cards before. When you look at this group, then you Oh, I guess you start from the beginning. Yeah, so you look at this one maybe. Oh, you just have one card left over. Huh? So yeah. All right, so you skip the first two, then you look at a group of three. And you say, okay, with this group of three and anything before my last boundary. Yeah, so it's gonna be something like, we can make this better to like something like DP at position and boundary. with some transition, which we can probably optimize. So this is order n, uh, this is also order n. So the transition is going to have to be fast somehow. Uh, but that's plausible. Someone solved it by now at least, surely, right? No. Someone has, just no one good. That's kind of wild. Um, alright. Well. Let's go then. So we have, uh... Yeah, we've got some position and some boundary. I guess, how does this work? So this 
this first sample is pretty good, I guess. Or maybe it's not that good. Maybe the second sample is better. One, one, then we have two, two, three. Then three, three, two. And then a one. So initially we have this position and then we start at this boundary, we move on to this boundary. And now we have to do a match here. So, oh, the, the number you have to match needs to be one of these three elements. You can't have three things that aren't like pigeonhole principle, there are only two other things, which means one of these three has to be the number you pick. So you, you have to pick, um, oh no, can you have two boundaries? Uh-oh. Mm. We can fix all of this by just putting two like negative ones at the end. Now it's we don't have to worry about the last test case. But Yeah, we can have stuff back here. We have a bunch of this stuff. And now we're gonna make a group. So we've got three, two things we don't care about, and we can take two from back here, and that can be our match. Then going forward, we have the two reds. So in this case, this is the boundary. But you might also have it so that you have two blues and then a blue back here. But then some reds back here. In this case, if you take the blues You can have two reds. Yeah, you have two different boundaries, that's weird. So you've got, like initially this was your boundary. So now you have one thing from this boundary and one thing from this boundary. Tricky. Well, to be honest, it is very early for me. I don't know that 5.50 a.m. is the optimal thinking time for my brain. Because I'm exceedingly tired at the moment. Hmm. 
Should we try it? Maybe we try it. So what was this end cube looking like before? Could we do something with like flow maybe? If we pick some group of three, what does that mean? Oh, maybe we can do like a left right sort of thing. We pick a group of three. That means, um, well, I guess that means we have a bunch of these border lines, which at most two things can cross. only have two across each of these. Yeah, your state seems pretty big. It seems like you've got an n squared state. Seems like you need to know where the last thing that's a one, because each of these can have like one thing or two things crossing them. If it's got one, then it still could have one more thing crossing it. But if it's got two, then everything before it is dead. I was definitely wrong about how difficult this problem is. I thought it would be easier, but it's not. Is it guaranteed that each integer n will appear exactly three times in the array? Not necessarily. Even if that were guaranteed, I don't know how helpful it would be.
It's uh, quite the step up. This went from a very, very doable problem to, hmm. Looks like most people don't know how to do it even. That's not true. Some people can do it. But yeah, look at the scoreboard distribution. 9,000, 8,000, 7,000, 1,000, 1,004. <laughs> uh, all right. It'll smooth out over time, of course, but still. So you have two different things that both cross this barrier. If we use maybe three different candidates to cross the barrier. If we have a white here and here, like some other things we don't care about. So if we pick these two, then we can just get, we can get this group, we can also get this group. You can get two for sure. You take this group here. That means crossing this border, you have nothing. That's not helpful. Yeah, I suppose I guess a rather nice property is you never have three lines that intersect a given position in your answer. Mm. Thinking maybe it's possible to do something, some sort of like LRDP.
Well, to be honest, I'm not sure. And, uh, I don't know. I'm a little, I'm a little tired. I've been up for two hours, and it's already 6 a.m. So, um, I think it might be helpful to just do solutions right now. And then I'll think about this after a nap. Then I'll be more productive for sure. Um, but yeah, as far as getting AC, I guess I stand a chance at getting it. Maybe like a 30% chance that I get it right in contest. Um, I don't know that it's worth that to me. I don't really care about my rating too much it's more just about practice and as far as like practicing to get better I don't know that 6 a.m. I don't know that 4 to 6 a.m. is the best time to do that I think maybe when I'm like better rested and can actually think that might be a better time to do these harder problems it's a good problem I like it I just don't know how to how to do it so yeah, we'll do we'll do solutions now, and then I'll take a nap, and uh, probably I won't record myself or anything, but I will give this another shot, likely on some paper, because I don't really have many ideas to go down at the moment. Like I was thinking maybe some bit side stuff that seems kind of janky. Maybe you can do like some, it feels like a DP sort of thing. But I don't really know where to go. If it winds up being max flow, that's a super cool problem. Uh, I just, it doesn't, I don't see how you could possibly turn it into that. Because you're matching groups of three, not groups of two. So, yeah, maybe it's bipartite. You've got the edges and then the. Uh, mm. Yeah, I don't. It's hard, it's hard to represent this as a flow graph because like this one here, you have no idea whether it should be like, I, I just don't see how you do it. Like every way I can come up with in my head has a break case I can come up with. And then it seems like all my DPs would be uncubed. Like it seems like you need to keep track of both the last the last position that like two things crossed over and also the last thing that one crossed over. Or alternatively, you need to keep track of what the two things you're holding are. Yeah, it seems like, yeah, I don't see how you can cut down on that. Clearly there's a way to, because there's no way n-cubed passes. I just don't see what it is. So I'll, I'll work on it more after I take a nap. Uh, let's do solutions. On the, on the brighter, brighter side. Uh, solutions to A through E. I won't do F, obviously. So um, A, B, and C, I think, are all pretty pretty straightforward. Um, a, the number of, like, you, you take uh, X pieces at a time. Each time you take a group, you, that takes T minutes. So you just multiply your answer by T, basically. The question is, how many groups do you need? And if you take at most X pieces at a time, you take as many pieces as you can um, up until you need fewer than X pieces, and then you just take however many you need. So the answer to that will be the ceiling of n divided by x. So it's n, oops, it's n divided by x, uh, ceilinged. 
Now, if we want to do this with integer division, we can do n plus x minus 1 over x, and that will give us an integer answer without having to call like math.seal or something like that. Uh, that way it's all, all integers, so it's easier to work with. Code for that is very simple. It just looks like this. Uh, I think you need longs, but yeah, you don't even need longs. So it's very easy. Okay, cool. Um, let's move on to problem B. Multiples of 9. This one's super easy because they tell you how to do it. So the sum of your digits is a multiple of 9. That means you're a multiple of 9. And um, I suppose that's, that's it, right? So you just read in the string, and then you count to do its digits sum to a multiple of 9. Some of its digits will be a relatively small number. It'll be at most 10 times the length of this number. So it'll be at most like 2 times 10 to the 6. So you can just add those all up. It won't overflow ints. Uh, and the code just looks like this. And then similarly, problem C is also pretty straightforward, I think. Um, you need to give uh, like stools to certain people. Um, in such a way that each person can, they're at least as tall as all the people in front of them. So you wouldn't want to make them taller than that for two reasons. One, you would spend more total height on that stool than you otherwise would. And two, because it would make it even harder for the people behind that person to see. So really the decision you make for each person is fixed and the height that you set them to is exactly equal to either whatever their height is or the height of the previous maximum. Uh, you just have to increase their height until it hits one of those. So if you keep track of the previous maximum as you sweep through the array, you just need to keep track of what's the total amount you'd have to add to all stools in order to get to some height that works for this position. Uh, yeah, so code for that is also very simple. We just keep track of our answer and then the previous maximum. We update the previous maximum with our own height, and then we set our answer to this maximum is the new height we have to reach. Um, and then i is the current height, so this is how much we have to add. All right, very good. Uh, let's look at problem D, wizard and maze. So you have, um, you've got this maze, yeah, yeah. And then you can teleport. So this one's a good one to draw a picture for. Uh, here's the idea. If you've got some maze here, and uh, you're at some position, you can either walk to these four positions for free, or for a cost of one, you can walk to all of these positions in blue. So the idea is uh, we can build a graph out of all of these, and uh, the number of nodes will just be the total number of nodes in the grid. So we'll have n squared nodes. Then we'll have a bunch of edges, and I'll zoom in so you can see what they look like more clearly. But basically, from this node here, we'll have an edge to every one of these 24 other squares. Uh, this edge here will have a cost of 1, because it costs one spell in order to get from where he's currently standing to the blue edge or the blue node of course we only add these edges in if uh both of the nodes are roads if we can stand on both nodes if one of the nodes isn't traversable uh, we don't add an edge at all so now all of these have an edge of one and then all of the edges between two things like this have an edge of zero now all the problem is is what's the shortest path from the start point to the end point and we can do this in linear time. You can do it with Dijkstra's, of course. You can also do it in linear time with a uh, 0, 1 BFS is what it's called. So 0 slash 1 BFS. The idea is with a normal BFS, you can find the shortest distance between one node and every other node in the graph in linear time by just doing a regular BFS. And then the distance to everything will be like the distance from the previous thing plus the distance to this next thing. That guarantees, like, by the way the BFS works, it guarantees you'll visit things from shortest to farthest away. Um, with 0, 1 BFS, it's similar. The difference is, instead of adding stuff to the end of your queue, always, 
you edit to the beginning of your queue if you ever take a zero. So with, uh, with Dijkstra's, you need a priority queue because you might need to insert this next node that you're going to pick into some random position into the queue, which is a difficult thing to do. Uh, that's why you have the log factor because you don't know where you're going to put it. But if you know you're always going to put it, sorry, you know you're always going to put it either in the beginning or at the end, uh, it's a simpler problem to solve because you can do both of those if you have a double-ended queue called a deck. You can do both of those in constant time. So the the code for it, um, it's a little bit longer, but it's still simple in like what it's actually doing. Looks like this. Um, so here are, yeah, yeah. Here's my, my queue. So I have one queue of X's, one queue of Y's. And initially the queue just has, should just have zero in it. Where do I put zeros in? Oh, it's got the start, start position in it. Then here are the two different cases. So this is the, the, the walk up, down, left, right. This has a cost of zero. In this case, I add it to the beginning of the queue if the distance is a new new maximum, new best, rather. Uh, this is my, the 20, uh, what, 25 minus five other squares, so the 20 other squares are in this loop. And in this case, this has a cost of one. So if the cost of one is still beneficial, then we will add it to the queue like this, but we'll add it to the end of the queue. So, uh, yeah, so each node might be added to the queue at most twice, and each node has 25 edges, or 24 edges, I guess. So the total, although I double check these, so it has really like 29 uh, edges. So the total runtime will be 29 n times 2, which should be fast enough. So roughly, roughly 60, 60 n, uh, which should run fast enough. Okay. Cool, that is problem D. Uh, let's talk about problem E as well. All right, you've got the two-dimensional grid. Yeah, with your squares. So I talked about this a little bit when I was solving it, but there are a couple heuristics that we'll use. Uh, the main one, like the main idea, or I guess let's just talk about like kind of some greedy and then how we could adapt that greedy. So it's possible that yeah, it looks something like this, right? Let's say these are where all the bombs are or all the targets are. We can destroy this, uh, this vertical line and also this horizontal line. And basically those are independent operations. Um, they're not actually independent, but they're close enough to independent that thinking about them as if they're independent is a helpful thing to do. In this case, we get four points for deleting this vertical line. We also get three points for deleting the horizontal line. Now, that's almost always true. The one case that we have to be careful of is it's possible that there's a node in the middle that intersects both of these, and we've just double counted it. So we've given ourselves two points for it. We only should have given ourselves one point. Now, that's the only, ca the only like time in which this can actually happen, um, when there's this node that gets double counted. It doesn't happen like... We'll never double count two nodes, for instance, two targets. We'll always over count one or zero of them if we just do this greedy. So you might think, well, okay, so that means the greedy doesn't work. So we can't just pick the biggest, uh, the biggest, the best column and the best row. That's not true though, and here's why. The greedy is only off by at most one. If instead you don't pick a plus four and a plus three, if you pick like a, a column that has a plus three, right, this column's maybe a plus three, and this column's also a plus three, it's never gonna be better than this greedy. Even if the greedy is one lower than what it would suggest by picking the best column and the best row, it's still at least as good as picking anything else that isn't that optimal. So we're always going to actually go with this greedy. The question is just, is there a better pair of some best row and some best column that we can pick than this current one. In this case, we have found like we found this example. But uh, yeah, let's let's draw this example again actually. So maybe we had something that looks like here are horizontal ones, uh, and here is a vertical group of four. Let's draw it like this. 
Then we might also have a group of four like this. So the, our, our initial candidate was something like this. Um, and in this case, we would get seven, because we have a plus four here. Or we would get six. Plus four here, plus three here. Uh, but the minus one, because it shares this node, which is suboptimal. So instead, what we can do is we could have picked this group here, which is also a plus four, but it doesn't share an overlap with this column because we don't have a target right here. So that's, we're trying to look for, are there any answers that look like this? We want to do that in a relatively fast way, if possible. What we can do is just, if we have hash map of all of the points, and we can just very quickly check, does this point exist? We can verify whether we have um, two pairs like this, a maximal row and a maximal column. We can check if this exists where it doesn't have an overlap space in order number of points total. The way we do that is we just iterate over every maximal row and we iterate over every maximal column as well. And we just see, is there a point here? Um, if there isn't, that means we found the best we could possibly do. If there is a point there, then we keep going on to the next one, but we'll only count each point once. So that means if you have like 10 to the 5th maximal rows and also 10 to the 5th maximal columns, you're going to find a pair of a row and a column that work very quickly. You're not going to have to scan through all 10 to the 10th of them because you only have like 3 times 10 to the 5th points anyway. So you're going to find one after 3 times 10 to the 5th plus 1 checks. Uh, at worst, might be faster. So yeah, you just have to remember to break out. Uh, the code for that looks like this. So you have the position of all, all, all the x's, all the y's, and then I've got my set of points. I also count how many points are on this x and on this y. So then I read in all of the points. Um, I store the hash value, like I convert each point to just a long basically by saying it's x times 10 to the 9th plus it's y. So that'll map each each uh, pair of x, y's to a single single value. Or you, if you're in C++, you can just do a pair of ints. Um, then once you have that, I calculate what is the most frequent row and the most frequent column. And I find all of the x coordinates that have that frequency, and same thing with the y coordinates, all the y coordinates that have that frequency. Then I just do an n squared, but I break early if I ever find that optimal thing. Like we talked about for the pigeonhole principle, this will happen pretty fast. Um, this inner loop will run at most um, the number of points times, because each point gets counted at most once. So yeah, that's problem E. Uh, problem F. I couldn't tell you, to be honest. Um, I'm going to have to think about it after a little bit of a break. So yeah, that's all for me. Uh, thank you for watching. I hope the contest uh, was fun for you. I enjoyed the problems. I thought the problems were good. Um, just uh, not really the time zone. A little bit early for me. But that's fine. Yeah, um, that's all. Hope you have a great day. Hope it was... Uh, a positive delta for you if you competed and it was rated. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.